it's it's the thing that keeps you up at night and wakes you up early is that I haven't read this book or that one or the other. Um, and, you know, I, I firmly believe that be doing a better job in five years than I, than I am today, and I think I'm doing a better job today than I was doing five years ago. Hi, I'm Alexandra Kitka, and this is Ergo. There's this picture that has gone around on the internet that depicts a monkey, a penguin, an elephant, and a grouping of other animals lined up before a tree. A man, presumably their judge or quite possibly a teacher, tells everyone to climb the tree as a fair assessment of their ability. The picture is captioned our education system and an Einstein quote underneath it reads, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Today I am joined by Greg Gunkel, a teacher of history and logic and the Dean of Academics at the Geneva School of Manhattan in New York, a private Christian school that prides itself on its classical style of education. In fact, he was my own teacher in the seventh and eighth grade. Aside from his career, Greg is also a father to how many children? Nine. Nine children, all of whom have gone to a variety of different kinds of schools. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. So let's start with just a little bit of your background. Why did you become a teacher? I became, actually, I was studying law in college, and I loved law, but I kept getting pulled into working with kids. I did Young Life. I worked with at our church. I go to the playground, and I just kind of hang out with kids. So inevitably, I just ended up, uh, I needed to get a job. I didn't want to go to law school, and I ended up with a teaching job that just fit perfectly. And why history? Well, it's, it's interesting. That was the first thing I was asked to teach, but it was also my interest. Everything has its story, and history is the story of everything. So the school I currently attend is an international baccalaureate school, um, and I remember being in middle school and you mentioning that you at one point taught in an IB school. Um, so can you describe briefly the different kinds of schools that you've experienced working with, and also perhaps what schools your children have gone to? Sure. Um, I started teaching at a private school that was very uh, limited. They just used textbooks, and um, people just kind of went through the motions, and I got bored with that rather quickly. So I ended up going to graduate school and working at a couple different schools. I worked in a private school in West Philadelphia, um, actually two private schools in West Philadelphia. I worked in a classical school in Delaware, and then I came back up, and I wanted to live in Bethlehem. I had no job and no prospect of a job, but I moved to Bethlehem because it's really pretty, and I wanted to live back with my family, and lo and behold, there was a job at an international baccalaureate school, so I worked there for six years teaching philosophy and history and enjoyed it thoroughly. It's a wonderful way to teach. So part of this conversation today is going to be a little bit of an excuse for me to just ask you questions about <laughs> why you did what you did. Um, <laughs> not an interrogation. Um, <laughs> But so I'm wondering, when, when you taught um, history and logic to me and my fellow classmates, the, one of the things I remember the most is that the first assignment of every year was a, a philosophy of education, hmm. um, which seems like a little bit of a strange thing to have 13-year-olds write. Um, so I'm wondering, why, why would you do this? Why would you have 13-year-olds write their philosophy of education? Absolutely. Um, that's actually one of my favorite assignments. And uh, we actually do it as a third assignment now because we get a little warmed up for it. You guys were a little more advanced. But um, the philosophy of education is so fundamentally important because life is short and you have to form good habits early. And if you don't understand what you're doing, you're not going to invest yourself in it. So why would you come to school every day, get up early, do all that hard work if you don't even know why you're doing it? So we wanted students, I wanted students not only to know what they're doing, but I also wanted them to discover it for themselves. So I would give you guys some readings um, that were sort of geared to what we do and hoped that you would discover them. And then some, some of the philosophies of education were, uh, were not quite the same as what we thought, and it created for a great conversation and allowed you guys to have a dialogue with me about what we're doing and for you to invest in it. Because of the internet and its capabilities, I was actually able to take a look at my philosophy of education <laughs> from both seventh and eighth grade. Um, and I can say it was quite amusing. Um, but I will I definitely agree with what you're saying, because even though that's not a requirement that I am still doing, um, 
it is still something that I always think about. Um, and being able to look back and see what I thought the point of education was when I was in seventh grade, when I was in eighth grade, is something that's pretty amazing. I would encourage you to write one as you graduate and go to college. Uh, revise it, reform it, and think about what you're going to do after this. Let's return to the picture I described at the beginning of this podcast. As someone who develops curriculum but also recognizes the differences between students, what is your magic formula for creating a system that is the same for everyone but also teaches everyone? Well, I think the trick is there's no magic formula, but I think the trick, and uh, this is why I especially like classical education, is the focus is on learning to think and learning to think through subjects. So when you're dealing with a subject, you might have a student, for instance, that struggles quite a bit, and you might have a student that gets things right away. But the student who struggles, you're working on a process of learning. You're lear working on the tools of learning. So if they can develop those tools of learning, it's not about the, the A or the B or the C or that sort of thing. It's about how much they grow as a thinker and how much they grow in discerning. And what we found is, for instance, um, which you participated in the shared inquiries with great books, what you find are the students that are really, the A students struggle with shared inquiry discussions because they're not used to having other students tell them that they're wrong or they disagree where the students that um, really struggle with other topics do quite well in those exercises because they're really creative and excited. And so classical education works on this student's ability um, rather than just checking off boxes and covering information. I've noticed this pattern, especially living in New York City, um, where there's an overwhelming stress on getting your kid to the perfect school, the one that fits them exactly. Um, so there's so many different kinds of schools beyond public and private. There are specialized high schools, performing arts high schools, magnets, progressive schools, alternative schools, and the list goes on. Um, but I find, and I think that you would agree with me, that when you're talking about a classical education, what you're doing is you're forgetting about the differences and you're talking about what makes all of the, the common base that all of humans share. Absolutely, it's part of human nature, the way people learn, the way they think. Um, the trivium is like a life. You have a grammar, you have a dialectic, and you have a rhetoric stage, and that happens within each individual conversation, and it happens across grade levels, and it certainly happens in the human spirit. So absolutely. For those who are not familiar with the classical model of education, will you just briefly go into that? Sure. It, Usually when you, somebody asks you about classical education, they talk about the trivium, this idea that you first learn the grammar of a subject or the grammar of life. You uh, then learn to argue through those things in a time period when, when students are very argumentative and love to debate. And then when students get to an age where they want to express themselves, you have the rhetor rhetoric stage where you teach them formal writing and arguing and, and all that sort of thing and it comes to fruition. That's the full student. Um, but I think more than anything else, uh, classical education in specific is really about loving texts, loving ideas, um, and having great conversations about them. It's the liberal arts. It's the training that's been done for thousands of years and has worked quite well. How do you compare that with, let's say, the typical American way of schooling? Um, my children come home with assignments. Now, they're not in the DP for IB yet, but they're in an IB school, and they come home with assignments that are really frustrating and they're canned and they're very uh, unnatural. Um, you know, they have to fill in blanks and they don't really know what the blanks are about. They don't really know what they're reading or the stories are so ridiculous because they're not beautiful stories intended to, to make you think. They're stories to cover information. And, and that's just deadly when you're just covering stuff. Um, you know, it, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, life is about stories and conversations, and education should do that as well. Now, a common thing that I hear a lot of students say, especially students my age, um, is that they think, uh, here, here's a common one, um, high school, we should learn how to pay our taxes. Uh, we should learn how to do the things we need to do to be adults. So what do you think is the relationship in education between the practical, the things that you have to know, and the idealistic, the things that you want to know? Well, let's look at this logically. Um, and actually, it's kind of funny. I think that you were listening in at my kitchen because my wife and I had this conversation the other night. And she's very practical. And she said, well, they should learn this, that, and the other. And the 
my concern about that is is twofold. One is that you simply can't teach students all the things they need to know to be adults. Um, it's impossible. Uh, yeah, you're maybe balancing a checkbook here, they're sewing something, but um, there are just uh, 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 so many things you have to understand as an adult. It's not just filling out a tax form, it's what do you do when the IRS sends you a letter that says you owe $5,000 and you didn't know you owed it. Um, what do you do when your children get into, oh, there's all sorts of things, you just simply can't be prepared. Uh, and much better to have students learn wisdom so that whatever they face, they say, how do I approach this? What do I do? What are the questions I ask? What am I, what would a good life look like? Those, I think, are the fundamental things. I think that you can have anyone learn or teach themselves. If you can learn Latin and Greek and translate things, I think you can figure out a checkbook. Sorry, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so along similar lines, um, there are a lot of schools in different countries um, where you start focusing way earlier. Um, I know, for instance, in the UK, um, once you reach the age of 16, you only choose around three or four classes to focus on. Um, and at that point, there are no requirements. So you can take all math classes, you can take all history classes, you can take a mix if you want. Um, but the idea is that you're developing what you want to do so that when you go to university, you know exactly what you want to study. Um, however, what you're suggesting seems to be that there should never be that uh, specialization. Is, is, is that right? Well, no, you should have a specialization, but after you've mastered the basic, the, the trivium. The quadrivium, the second part, is a mastery of a particular subjects. But what you want to start off with is that mastery of thinking, that mastery of, and, and developing experience and maturity. Um, you know, I, I went to a, a heavy, heavily elective uh, university, and I, I think I had six majors at last count, and um, you tend to not be at an age to, to understand what we really want to specialize in. So as my father used to always say, your specialty is in learning to think and learning to become a prudent person first. Um, after that specialization comes. Um, but it's part of that industrialization and it's part of that reductionism that we have in modern thinking. So let's get down to the more practical. As a teacher, how, how do you approach the classroom? How do you teach? Um, now, I remember you have taught in lectures. We've done, um, as you say, shared inquiries. Where should that balance be between what the teacher says and the student's input? That's a, such a great question because what you'll find when you have a discussion as opposed to a lecture, and I, I actually learn, I prefer a lecture myself as a student, but what you find is the students tend to get bits of information. It's more covering things than it is really uh, the students stepping into that world. So what you really have to do is balance those activities. So you might have a lecture to set up a discussion and a reading, or you might have a, a lecture following that up, or you might have an essay, or you might have a debate. But really the idea in, um, our, our idea is that when you get up to the upper school, it's about 30% direct instruction and about 60, 70%, 40, you know, coming in of uh, student activity, whether that's a debate, whether that's uh, students teaching lessons, whether that's students uh, responding to a question or that sort of thing, or, or a discussion group. Um, but you have to have both. You, you do have to have direct instruction, and you do, but it should be in relation to a discussion in class. It should be in relation to an activity, whether that's feedback or, or taking the conversation in a certain direction or focusing on one aspect of it. Have you ever taken the test of um, what kind of learner you are? I have not. I don't like those. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, so I've taken it before. Um, I'm an auditory learner. What I find is that, similar to you, lectures are something that really works for me. Um, when I hear lectures, I don't even have to really take as many notes as a lot of my classmates because somehow it just kind of gets imprinted in my brain. Um, but I know a lot of students for whom that is not the case at all. They're more visual learners, so they have to write every single thing down and then highlight it in 12 different colors in order to understand what's happening. Um, so I'm wondering, as a teacher, should you be aware of uh, how, how should you deal with students coming from different places and maybe one student not really responding to lectures as much as someone else? Yeah. I look at that the same way um, I learned to play soccer. Our, our soccer coach always said that every player 
you know, you might have a wonderful uh, right foot and you might be able to put the ball in the top, or top right corner, um, but you also have to be able to defend. You also have to be able to run. Um, there's all sorts of skills that make you a complete soccer player, and it's the same with teaching. Um, you certainly want to be aware of that, and, and any teacher who the first rule is always to study your students and know their strengths and weaknesses, uh, you play to those. Sometimes you press a child to, ex to grow in an area. I have one student who, if you give her uh, two days to prepare for a speech, she will, uh, you know, she'll sound like a Russian novelist. She's wonderful. But um, this year, uh, we, we had an assignment that was specifically for her. They wrote an outline on uh, Mortimer Adler on how to do history. I took that away and gave them five minutes to prepare and called on her first. And she stumbled through it a little bit. So afterwards, I made sure to go up to her and say, do you know why you went first? Because that's an area that I really want to see you improve on. And I was really proud of you that you did as well as you, as she did an, a wonderful job, but it wasn't the same performance she would have had had she had a week to prepare and she would have read her speech. So we, you have to be aware of those things as a teacher and you have to play to their weaknesses and their strengths. And you have to encourage them in their weaknesses and you have to praise them in their strengths. I think it's important to highlight that learning is not just about the confines of the classroom and that school is really preparing you for a whole lifetime of learning. And I think that what you're saying is especially true to that because when you're in life, you can't pick and choose how you are going to learn. The learning experiences just kind of come up at wherever they're from. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, as you were saying that, one of the things that I think is, is um, if we can backtrack a little bit to the difference in types of education, and uh, there's great education, any, you know, uh, there, are, there are a number of wonderful institutions, I'm not saying there, there are not, but one of the things that really bothered me when I was in the IB school, uh, the DP wasn't this way, but the, the MYP and the PYP teachers tended to think that learning was not something that they needed to participate in. It wasn't a lifestyle for them. And one of the things I love about what you just said is that to me, I would do this whether you paid me or not, whether there were students or not. This is what you do as a human being. And it is a life choice. And you know, everything we ask our students to do here, we do it with them. We are active learners. I know that's a trite statement, but it's very, very true that you have to invest and have value in what you're doing the same way. That's where that's what a house of intellect is. I actually wrote down um, the common saying that teachers say, which is, "I'd like to think my students teach me," <laughs> <laughs> and you essentially just hit the nail on that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, and and that's something. Just today, we were working on our thesis. Uh, they were picking their topics. They're, this year, we're starting with people first, and they're just picking figures that they're interested in. And these are figures I've looked at for years, but th just the um, one student said. Uh, their comment uh, about uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who's of course one of my favorite figures, said, wh why are we still talking about this president? What, what is it about Dwight Eisenhower that makes us remember him? And it made me think, well, why am I so fascinated with him? He looks like a grandfather. He, he was a, a pretty amazing man, but you would think that in the modern world, someone like that might get lost. Um, but there's something, and it made me question, well, why do I really admire him? Um, you know, and I, I actually spent what I was supposed to be grading papers during a free period thinking about what the student had brought up in my class. So I think that's really, it is. You absolutely do learn if you do it the right way. I also think that in the relationship between a teacher and student, um, as a student myself, um, it's really important that a teacher doesn't see themselves as this big vat of knowledge that is just waiting to be released onto these poor, helpless youngsters. Um, and the way that you're talking about your students clearly seems that you do respect them and you do respect their thinking. Well, y I, I don't think it can be any other way. Anyone who's learned anything is going to be humble. I mean, think about uh, what we have to know. Look, think about history. It's, it's constantly expanding. We're reconsidering everything. It's, it's the thing that keeps you up at night and wakes you up early is that I haven't read this book or that one or the other. Um, and you know, I, I firmly believe that I'll be doing a better job in five years than I, than I am today, and I think I'm doing a better job today than I was doing five years ago, so sorry. Um, and that's because we, you know, we read and we study and we learn. And I think that is the 
base core uh, attribute for that is humility. You have to be humble before the great vastness of knowledge and, and understanding and wisdom that's there for us. There's a quote, and I may butcher it um, because I'm not looking at it, but um, it's something like, the man who stops learning today is uneducated by tomorrow. Um, and I think that if I were to create a philosophy of education like I did in seventh and eighth grade, I think I would start with that quote. Because I think too often we think that education ends when, you, when the bell rings. Uh, but what you're bringing up about humility and about wisdom, that's not necessarily n a related to the mathematical equations you learn. It's about the process. Can you talk a little bit more about how to educate the whole person rather than just the mind? Well, I think that that's, that's where that process comes in because it, one of the things that you remind students of, and you know, whenever you, you hear so many quotes about history is this and it repeats itself and all this sort of thing, um, I think the greatest gift, you asked earlier about um, why I teach history, and I didn't really understand it when I started teaching history, but uh, uh, when you look at someone like Mr. Lincoln, for instance, he had an amazing ability to step outside of himself and look at the world in a way that no one else could. And that's why he was able to guide us through so much. And um, history does that for us, where we step outside of ourselves and we look at the world we live in. And I think even now, especially, where students are so caught up in the moment and so caught up in the latest and so looking to one or two days ahead and it's a disposable society, more than ever, they need to step outside of the world they live in and be able to look at it and say, well, isn't that odd that, we sp that we're really valued now, not for truth, goodness, and beauty, but rather how many likes, or, or I don't know anything else other than likes, maybe memes are they? I don't know. <laughs> um, but whatever it is on social media that, that gives us this you know, endorphin rush in our brain is not nearly as valuable as being able to look at the world we live in and say, well, that's odd that we do that. Um, I always think of Mr. Lincoln and um, a, uh, uh, Mark Twain's uh, Yankee in, in King Arthur's court. Uh, everything was strange and odd. Um, some things were good and some things were bad, but that's how we ought to look at the world and that's what history does for us. And that's what true education will do for us. It'll make us dinosaurs in the, in the world we live in, um, but we'll be happy dinosaurs and we'll know the good and the bad, not just the popular. Not everyone will grow up to be an academic or even an accountant, you know. We have to have plumbers and police officers. So how do we make sure we don't prize this kind of education over th those things that are still required in life, the, the practical? Yeah, I, you know, my father never went to college and he's the smartest man I know and he's very wise. Um, and I think sometimes that, you know, I always say this to my own children, I say, um, I will talk to them about, the, I don't care if they're a truck driver or president of the United States, as long as they are thinking virtuous people, that's the focus. So um, some of the, the most intelligent people we have in the world are auto mechanics, and um, there's, we shouldn't sell that short. But as Mortimer Adler always said, philosophy is, for, is everyone's business. Every decision in life is, a, is hopefully something of a rational choice, and that requires philosophy, and that requires prudence. So. Um, uh, the idea of looking at all of life as the good life is part of a vocational calling, but then there's also, um, you know, I, I always think about it when I, I work in the yard in the summer, I'm, I'm thinking about great ideas and it makes the work so much better. And I understand that I'm connecting to a community and a place and a time, and that makes it so much more meaningful than just working in the yard, because quite frankly, I don't like manual labor. Um, so when I'm doing it, I have to have a great thought for it, but how much better is it that we understand what we're doing as we're doing it? So I, I don't think we should sell those things short, but I, think it's, I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a both and. People have replaced true education with a vocabulary list. And people like to say big words um, in complicated ideas and quote people with obscure German names. <laughs> um, and sometimes, the ideas that people are saying get so fogged up in our minds because of these big words that they're using that we forget about the actual thing that they're saying. I've heard people talk and sound like they are the most sophisticated, educated people on the planet. But when you really listen to what they're saying, their idea is stupid. <laughs> and um, so I really, I think it all goes back to humility, which is what you said before. Knowing that, um, actually, 
another teacher at the school, Ms. Smith, would always say, all I know is not all there is. And I think that that's really the idea that you have to get it. We've talked about your role as a teacher, but I also want to talk about your role as a parent. What do you think is the responsibility of the parent in educating a child? You know, that, that's a great question because you were talking about different learners. My oldest uh, children are, are really artistic and they love culinary arts. Um, you know, my son Jared, who uh, is into cinema and wants to make movies. Um, one is recognizing their talents. You know, I, I, all of them we've wanted to promote the virtue of learning and loving learning for its own sake and being full people. But then after that, taking that learning and applying it in whatever you do. But I think the biggest role in a parent is to make yourself uh, unnecessary, that you're trying to raise children that, that will be uh, adults and prudent and, and do well on their own, not needing you to stand over their shoulder and tell them what to do. So everything you're doing is the acorn becoming the oak. So what about practically speaking? When a kid comes home with their homework uh, and they have no idea what to do, um, what what should the parent do in that situation? You know, that's a I love that question because it's so open-ended. It really depends on the homework and it really depends on the child. I have one that I'll step back and say, hmm, I have no idea. Um, good luck with that. Um, because that's a child who just wants me to do their work for them. Um, but then I have other children who will get frustrated and just need to hear the steps. And then you have some that you just need to sit down and, and, and read with them. And then you have others, especially boys, I would say, you need to just take them for a walk and give them 10 minutes to just walk through it and you just, you just walk quietly and they'll tell you what they're struggling with and then you'll figure out whether they need help or not. But you have to approach them. Um, the biggest myth, I think, in, ed in parenting when I first became a parent, I thought they would all be the same way and they would all follow this model and they would be so easy and everyone would be the same. And what you find out is you've got uh, nine strangers in your home to a certain extent and it's your job to get to know what makes them tick and drive them in that direction. Well, not everyone will have nine, but... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm have kind of the Brady Bunch going on. An overachiever in that way, yes. <laughs> um, so my parents, I don't want to say that they've been hands-off in their approach, um, but... <laughs> yeah. To an extent, I think that when you when you compare me and the way I've gone through school um, with even my brother or um, you know my next door neighbor, um, my, at this point, I think my parents just kind of know that I'm going to get done what I need to get done. Um, but even when I talk about elementary school, my mother is an elementary school teacher, so you would think that when I came home, she would want me to you know do my homework. But that was never the case. Um, I would go play outside with the 12, 15 children that were on our block, and I would come home at 8 o'clock and then maybe think about doing my homework, but more likely just not doing it at all. Um, and whether or not she intended to um, have me live that way, I can honestly say that I don't think that, I, th I think that it turned out for the better. Mm. I think that the learning I did, not at school, but on the block, was actually more beneficial to my development as a human than what we were doing in school. Um, we created countries, we had clubs, we organized spy missions. Um, and in a sense, I think that that kind of imagination is really what you want to happen with education in the first place. Yeah, and I, you know, I can speak as a, as a, Having been your former teacher, I always appreciate the way your parents dealt with things. They would always respond. They were always, okay, thank you. Um, not that we really had to send a lot of emails and <laughs> <laughs> for you, but um, that's extremely important, um, especially in New York City with the, um, I can't, my child can't uh, receive anything other than an A plus because they have to get into this school. Um, thankfully at Geneva, I have not seen that. Um, we have parents who are really concerned about their students learning first. And of course you want to go to the, you know, you want more choices better than less, but it's extremely important that students, and, and we really consciously think about that in terms of putting the responsibility of education on a student, which is so important. In middle school, I really didn't care about my grades. And that sounds like a terrible thing to say, but um, especially when I compare it to my current experience, um, now that I'm having to go into university soon, um, I think it's just 
amazing and yet a little bit strange that I remember in elementary, s in, in middle school, being okay with getting a B in Latin yeah. um, and not really caring what it said on the report card because I was so intensely focused on the fact that you had just won a debate over whether Santa Claus was real, arguing that he was. <laughs> um, and he is. I was in seminary and I had all these great professors and people were laughing at me because I went in to get my finals and I'd written, I penned one paper that I was really proud of and I was really excited about and I poured my heart into. And I had a stack of all my finals and I was throwing them over my shoulder in the room until I got to this paper and then I took a deep breath and opened it and the comments are things like, thanks so much for this. And I thought, thank you, Lord. <laughs> it wasn't, and you, as a student, I can tell you why you weren't concerned about grades because you would bump into your grades um, in your days to find truth. You were always so much more interested in what we were talking about than the result on that quiz. And, and thank goodness, that's why you are who you are today. Last year, I had to write a paper in Latin um, and our parameters were pretty wide open. Just pick, pick something and write about it. Um, and I had this crazy idea in my mind. We were reading love poetry, Roman um, love poetry, Propertius and Catullus. And I, I got the idea in my mind that I wanted to do a Freudian analysis <laughs> of these Roman poets. Um, but I was worried that my teacher would think it was too crazy and that these two things had nothing to do with each other. Freud came way after these Roman poets and that I would just fail epically <laughs> and it would just be a sad time. Um, so I went up to another teacher in my school who was a little bit more crazy and I, I told him what the idea was and I said, is it too risky? And I remember what he told me. He said, Alexandra, and then he, he uh, stipulated, when it comes to things in academia, when you think that something is a risk, go one step further. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I did end up writing that paper. Um, and honestly, I'm, s I'm still not quite sure if there is a connection at all, um, but it was certainly a learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mean, gr I think grades are important in, in that it keeps you accountable. Um, but I think that a lot of people, especially when it comes to a high school age, um, they will take the less risky route rather than going on the risky route and learning something more valuable. You know, we just talking about being a parent. I had one of my children, I'd come home, and my wife had a funny look in her eye, and I always know that's a problem. And so this, I won't say which son, but he came into the kitchen, and they're doing a, they watched a documentary on American uh, history, and the uh, idea was that the Chinese had discovered America before Columbus, and they watched a documentary on this, and I said, oh, great, okay, what's the evidence? And they said, well, they found an anchor that was prior, you know, they traced it back before Columbus, and I said, okay, well, that's great. What are the other things we should see? And he said, well, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, if are we talking, first off, about discovering, meaning settling? Are we talking about going by? Well, I'm sure a lot of people went by um, even before the Chinese. So we started unpacking this and asking a lot of questions and I said, well, you should list out all the questions you have that you would need to solve, you know, what Dan Robinson of Oxford would say is a problem of knowledge. And he looked back at me and said, I think she just wants me to write that the Chinese discovered America before Columbus. And that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so I kind of gave him a dirty look and said, okay, but do you understand what you're losing here? Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, of course you want to uh, earn grades, but I think the grade should represent something and it should represent your best effort. And you're, you're only going to live once, you're only gonna have that class once, you're only gonna have that grade once, so why not make sure if it's an A, it's an A for the right reason? I am in mo the Model United Nations Club, um, and whenever we go to conferences, no matter what the issue is, everyone always brings up education as the answer to all of our problems. Mm -hmm. Apparently it can solve economic disparity, sexism, mm -hmm. racism, and everything everything in the clouds. Um, do you think that that's true? <laughs> there, there's a great book, um, I think the uh, professor's name Perkins, um, I read in grad school called The Imperfect Panacea, and it's a, it's a historical examination of that idea in American history. And 
Um, no, education is certainly part of that. Um, if, if every problem is solved philosophically, well, there's a training in that, but I think that there's also experience in life, and there's also uh, many, many ways we can approach things, and education's a big portion of that, but it's certainly not gonna solve any problems. It's a tool, um, uh, and, and, and it's a good tool, but it's a tool. I wanna end with this, um, and this is, I, th I think, if I can remember correctly, something that you would always want us to end on in any class, which is the so what. Whether we are in school or out of it, um, or have been for a long time, what do you think that we can be doing to make sure that we are still being educated? That is such a great question. I, whenever I think of that, when, um, as you know, I, I get up early, I have a long commute into the city, and and I'm usually on a bus for a long period of time, and and I look around and see all my friends on the bus, um, well, not friends, just people who are always on the bus with me, uh, usually playing video games or, or doing, listening to music way too loud, and, and I'm there listening to my podcast, probably this one at some point this week or next week, and I, I always think about the fact that, um, and this is something that, I don't know if you remember this, but you know, that the, the purpose of education isn't to solve the world's problems, but it's to learn to die well. Um, that if you die well, you've lived well. If you can lay on your deathbed, if you're blessed enough to be able to have your family around you on your last breath, and you, you're not going to say, I just wish I had played one more video game, I wish I'd caught that YouTuber. Um, but if you say, I lived a good life, I did the best I could, I was honest and humble, and I took advantage of every single minute I have, uh, that's what an educated person does, so that's what I would say. So learn to die well. Yes. I want to thank you for uh, letting us come here today. Um, we're currently in a science classroom. It's kind of funny because I don't think we mentioned science in this entire <laughs> podcast about education. Um, our executive producer will have to note that for future episodes. Thank you so much for listening today. Um, if you want to find out more about uh, Greg Gunkel or the school, um, please check out uh, the Geneva School of Manhattan. Um, if you want more information about me, you can check out my website at alexandrakitka.com. That's A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A-K-Y-T-K-A dot C-O-M. Thanks. Thanks.